Good morning. Uh, my name is Espen Osset. This is my colleague, uh, Gordon Kalea. We are from the IT University of Copenhagen Center for Computer Games Research. Although I always regret that we call it that, because I think we should just have called it games research. Uh, I don't find computer games especially interesting or useful category. It's certainly not analytically valid. Uh, and uh, we are talking about so many other things than computer games, and looking at so many other things than computer games that it seems more like a, sort of a, a strategic marketing move more than anything. Um, <clears throat> today uh, we'll talk about the uh, problem of definitions and uh, somehow perhaps slightly uh, diverge from Grant's uh, notions, but certainly finding many of them useful. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll start by saying this. Computer games are not games. That's a mistake to make that assumption. They could be, some of them, uh, but it's, it's too simple to, to put it like that, basically. Computer games are first and foremost, it seems, software. And in fact, uh, 20 years ago, at this university, uh, my often Jon Lundstedt wrote uh, a master's thesis in uh, literature uh, called Epic Software, where he was looking at adventure games or interactive fiction and uh, using the term software to describe them. So I think already here, 20 years ago, there was a notion that these things that we call computer games could certainly be called other things. And it's a sort of historical uh, 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 incidence that uh, computer games were used for many of these things, or video games, digital games, etc. So what we could call, say then about a video game or a computer game as notions or as, as labels is that they are metonymies for software. When we are speaking of things like uh, Max Payne, Half-Life 2, uh, we are in fact discussing software uh, that we call by the metonymy game. Uh, and of course then we have to ask the thing, next question, so what is the game in the game? For instance here we have Max Payne 2. Is it a game? Is it just a game? Is it more than a game? They, interestingly on the package they call it a film noir love story, so they don't even use, invoke the term game. Or computer game, or video game. Uh, somebody wrote a review, not of Max Payne, but of some other game that they didn't like, and they decided it was so bad that they would burn the game, and they put it in the microwave. Now, is it possible to burn a game? Well, I don't think so, but clearly, in one way it is, if you look at a game as a piece of, well, hardware or software. But, of course, clearly that is uh, not necessarily how we would like to use the word game. Uh, but that's, that's one of the questions we're asking today. Uh, so, question number one, is it possible to define games? Uh, maybe, but some of us don't think so. Uh, and what, ha what if we don't? What's the problem that, what's the worst that could happen? Don't we have a field anymore? If we don't uh, define games, uh, is there no such thing as game studies anymore? Suddenly it disappears. We decide, oh, it's not possible. The field goes away. Uh, no. So it may not be a big problem if we can't find the one and only future definition of games. Uh, perhaps, as we will argue, a good alternative is to recognize that we don't need a definition. We need some sort of description to figure out what's going on. That could just be a descriptive model that for. It might be over descriptive, over productive, but that may not be a problem because maybe the term is over, over uh, productive as well. Uh, and with a good descriptive model, we hope to address uh, the crucial multidisciplinary problems, needs, and approaches that we see in this field. There are so many different approaches to games that it's hard to list every one uh, on a piece of paper. Any academic discipline can be, uh, can be applied to games, so there are basically no limits. Imagine all those problems that uh, gives rise to. 
uh, as you know, interdisciplinary is really hard, even if you only have two disciplines. Imagine 15 disciplines. Uh, well, it's, it's rather an issue. So we need somehow to conceptualize gain, uh, but having an exclusion, uh, exclusion uh, definition is probably too harsh and will probably lead to more problems than it solves, as I think we've already seen. Uh, so, uh, also I guess at this university, but maybe not, uh, Arne Ness, the Norwegian famous philosopher, uh, coined uh, the term a verb, uh, merely verbal disagreement. Uh, that is, when two people are using the same word with different meanings and they don't realize that they have different meanings, then there may or may not be a real disagreement, but uh, many times it's uh, merely a verbal disagreement. So if they only realized that they're using the term differently, there wouldn't have been a disagreement in the first place. And I think that's uh, probably the case with many of the disputes that we have seen in the last 10 years in, in game studies. So can games be defined? Uh, well, I think uh, I, would, I would slightly disagree with Grant in that we have tried, or people have tried to define uh, games for a long time, and also certainly computer games for more than 27 years or so, uh, and not really succeeded. So there is a problem here, and there is still no clear definition of games despite many uh, excellent attempts. So maybe uh, we can't have one, or maybe we should try to uh, Imagine a future where there will not be one. Uh, Arnenes, as I said, would, would uh, perhaps say that this is uh, yet another case of this. Uh, so we could argue, why, why not just, uh, just let's call them games to help with definitions. Uh, well, that the problem is, of course, we are then not talking about the same thing, and, or that could be the case. So we, have, we, we need to go beyond just calling them games, whatever they are. So, yeah, social scientists versus humanists, they would look at these things or these phenomena or these things they would label uh, games really differently. So we are, we are in need of something, some model that would describe this. Uh, yeah, or the famous notion of uh, ludology versus narratology, which some of you have heard of. I'm so tired every time I hear that uh, debate or crazy debate framed in terms of ludology versus narratology, uh, I, I want to reach for my dictionary because uh, every ludologist is actually a narratologist, so how can they be against themselves? I mean, this is a really strange thing once you start to think about it, which I guess most people haven't when they address some sort of a quarrel in the field of game studies in the terms ludology versus narratology. Anyway, that, that's also an interesting question which we are hopefully addressing with this, uh, uh, with our model. Uh, anyway, so these, we, we, have, uh, we have at least two, uh, uh, we're going to use at least two major disputes in the field as, as uh, our examples for what we could actually solve by coming up with a good descriptive model. This leads to uh, Wittgenstein's point, uh, and he said more or less in uh, philosophical investigations, as you, as you know, uh, that, uh, yes, yeah, sure, you can try to, uh, you can attempt to define games formally, but chances are you won't succeed. You will only succeed in defining a subset of games if you define games. Only a partial, uh, par uh, only, a, uh, only a part of, of the field of, of games will be defined. So, for instance, you can define board games because they have a shared set of uh, uh, necessary and sufficient features. Uh, but you, and you can find card games, but you can't come up with a definition that will uh, include all kinds of games. Uh, <clears throat> the, as he said, there, there are no commonalities for all games. And I happen to believe that he was right. I didn't at first, but then I thought about it, as he suggested one should, and I realized, yes, he's probably right. Ooh. But uh, is this a problem? Not according to Wittgenstein. People are still using the word uh, game successfully. Maybe not so much in academia, even if they manage to do it outside. The funny thing about definitions and, and uh, whether they're needed or not is that it, this is, of course, a problem in humanities and social sciences, perhaps. It's also clearly a problem in the natural sciences. Uh, recently, I guess, Pluto dis uh, disappeared from the list of planets, and that was uh, by vote, I believe. So in the natural sciences, they have to vote uh, over definitions. They can't just decide upon them 
analytically once and for all. They have to vote. So we're not the only ones who may or may not have a problem with, with these kind of uh, definitions. Uh, the problem, uh, as Grant was also talking about, is the game is not originally a theoretical term, it's a historical vernacular term. Uh, and so uh, if we then are trying to explicate it, uh, what we do, I think, clearly is to commit some sort of violence towards ordinary language use and language users. We are, we are in a sense saying to them that, you know, what you used to call games are no longer really games. Those things over there are no longer games. <laughs> So you shouldn't call them that. Please call them something else. I happen to think that's not really a, a, a sort of a good diplomatic move for academia to do that sort of thing. And of course, if, if, I mean, if they even would listen, but I, of course they won't. So it would just be futile to do that. So uh, we, that, that, in a sense, that is, that is the, one of the big problems here. Games are used legitimately in ways uh, that we can't define, formally at least. And if we want to look at whether this is important for us or not, we have, I think, to realize that we don't really need those definitions to have a field. Uh, other fields don't have them. Uh, literature don't have a definition of what literature is. Media studies can't agree on a, on a definition of what a medium is. And planetology can't agree either on what a planet is. But uh, they don't have this as a big fundamental problem. Maybe planetology does, but certainly uh, in our part of the academic world, we don't have that sort of... Uh, an identity crisis. Uh, so, and of course, also a definition, if it can be found, might be counterproductive. They might be uh, excluding really important uh, phenomena that we don't want to, uh, to exclude. For instance, there are some definitions of games that would exclude The Sims. Uh, that, that, I think, is a really bad move. Uh, the Sims is clearly a very important part of uh, game culture and game history, and to exclude it makes no sense. So uh, what we have is uh, some sort of uh, criticism of, of, I mean, what we will present now is some sort of criticism of existing definitions. They do exist, of course, uh, but they do happen to fall short, just like Wittgenstein said. Uh, so <clears throat> here's one example, one of the better examples. I'll just get my coffee. Uh, in a book called The Study of Games, uh, Elliot Averin and Brian Sutton Smith define games as following uh, an exercise of voluntary control systems in which there is an opposition between forces confined by procedure and rules in order to produce a disequilibrium outcome. Now, that is as good a definition as any. I, I happen to admire it a lot, but it does, in fact, require certain things which I think are not necessary for many types of games, that is the existence of rules and more than one playing agent. So if those things are needed, then there are many things that, that fall outside this definition. For instance, if you take rules, rules seem to be sort of the, the key factor in most formal definitions of games. Uh, however, I don't think that's a reasonable thing to have in that definition. For instance, if you look at these things, you have these metal puzzles over here. Uh, you have a labyrinth, in this case a uh, fictional labyrinth from The Shining. Uh, those are games, but they don't have rules. They don't come with rules, they don't need rules. They have goals, they have objectives, but they don't have rules in the sense that we uh, use the word. We might come up with a definition of rules that would change this, but I, that would be something we don't need now to call these things games. So it would be sort of a fake move, or cheating, you could say. Here's another example, a riddle. Riddles don't have rules either. Do you know the answer to this riddle? Anybody? What gets wetter as it dries? It's a riddle. Now. Yes. You won. We didn't have any rules. So, I mean, where are the rules in these cases? They don't exist. What do these things have in common? Well, that's also a really hard one. Maybe nothing except that they are games. We see them as games. Here's another definition, uh, Jesper Yule's so-called classic game model, which I also admire for its clarity and its uh, effort, so to speak. Uh, a game is a rule-based formal system with a variable and quantifiable outcome 
where different outcomes are assigned different values, the player exerts uh, effort in order to influence the outcome, the player feels attached to the outcome, and the consequences of the activity are optional and negotiable. Well, uh, it's a valiant attempt, but as I said, you don't really need rules. There's a problem. Also, I think there are many uh, games uh, that he claims that this is a, uh, a model of what games used to be, classic games. I think there are many examples of games or the, the, the similar words in other languages. For instance, if you go to the ancient Romans, uh, the Ludi Romani were not necessarily definable by his terms. For instance, the chariot rides would not have negotiable consequences. There would be rather dire and non-optional consequences of those things. And also there were lots of spectacles that would not need any kinds of rules. So, so it's not really a good definition in the way he claims it is. It's a good way of discussing the problems of definitions in a field. So it's a really useful and helpful definition. And also you have, yeah, so you have this, this idea, I think, in recent game studies that there is a, there's a, some sort of distinction, clear distinction uh, in language between the sort of soft games and the hard games. Uh, but that doesn't really apply to words like ludus. It was used both for the sort of rule-based strict uh, things and also other kinds of games. And uh, I guess, so there's another thing. If, even if we could find a formal definition, uh, somebody came up with a better definition than this that actually worked for many people. How would we decide that it was good enough? We couldn't do it in a formal framework because we don't have one common fa formal framework. So we would have to do it by vote. So in that sense, is it, uh, do we really need it? If, if two people disagree, we have a problem, right? Because we're not really Democrats here, face it. Okay, so I'll uh, stop there and give the word to Gordon. And also this thing. Sorry. Yep. Okay, so what would that descriptive model look like? And the first distinction that we feel needs to be made is um, an awareness of two complementary perspectives, game as objects and games as process. A board game like Settlers of Catan, for example, comes with a set of objects that facilitate gameplay, like the hexagonal board pieces, the wooden pieces, cards, and so on, as well as a set of game rules, which represent an ideal or suggested manner of playing the game. Settlers, as object, can be studied in terms of its visual design, the illustrations on its hexes and cards, the color schemes, and so on. We can analyze the way resources are harvested and distributed between players, and how this dis distribution affects the pace of the game, for example. Or we can consider the role settlers plays in the genealogy of board game design, and so on. So there's lots of judgments and analysis we can have on the game as object. These are all approaches that treat the formal properties of the game and have obvious value from both analytical and design perspectives. The definition offered by Tafnar before us addresses this perspective on games. Needless to say, this approach is equally valid for computer games. The game as object is always partial. The dominant code, board pieces, or rule set present a potential that is actualized during gameplay. In other words, when a player or players interact with them. This brings us to the second perspective, a game as process. So theorists like Taylor, Mallaby, and others have recently made strong arguments in favor of a processual approach to game research. Mallaby argues that one of the first things we must recognize is that games are processual. Each game is an ongoing process. As it is played, it always contains the potential for generating new practices and new meanings, possibly reconfiguring the game itself. So the term processual refers to the potential for change in every engagement. It favors a dynamic and recursive view of games. This approach also importantly implies that social, cultural, and experiential dimensions of game engagement are continuous with other forms and other domains of experience. This means that games cannot be conceptualized as experientially separate, as is the case with Bernard Stutt's notion of the illusory attitude, which has been adopted by the game theorists like Salen Zimmerman and Newell, among others, 
and which is obviously implied um, in the magic circle. And I think one of the problems with the magic circle is exactly because it makes a call about the game as object in terms of delineating a game space, right? This is where we're playing soccer, game ends over there and the fans are there, versus the game as process. And we can make those um, statements about the boundary of a game in terms of game as object, and magic circle might have some sense there, but when it comes to the game as process, to the experience, it becomes highly normative and problematic to um, make a call about when the experience actually is bounded, or if it should be bounded when we actually engage with the game. Now, Malaby formulates games as process that create carefully designed and unpredictable circumstances that have meaningful, culturally shared, yet open-ended interpretations. Therefore, both the game practice and the meaning it generates are subject to change. What we must keep in mind is that these approaches are partial. It is futile for one to criticize the other, as we've seen a bit possibly too much of in game studies, as neither the analytical method nor its intended goals tend to be aligned. It makes little sense for an anthropologist, a sociologist, a psychologist to argue that the typology of adventure games lacks a cultural experiential dimension. On the other hand, a game theorist that separates game from real life is making an untenable distinction between different activities that take place in the same social domain, thereby ignoring important work in fields that are better placed to comment on the issue. So the model we are proposing here elaborates upon our set cybertext framework, which gives a more accurate account of ergodic literature than the earlier distinctions of digital and non-digital, interactive non-interactive media allowed. The non-trivial effort required on the user is an important cornerstone of a theoretical model of games. Orsett also places importance on the role of code as a component of the science perceived by the user, as well as the specificity of the material medium. This gives three factors whose interplay yields a cybertext. The human operator, the sign, and the medium. These form a matrix where each of the vertices affects and is affected by the other two. The triadic matrix that Orsett proposes for cybertext will here be elaborated into a descriptive model of games. Made up of these elements, the material medium, the sign, the structure, and the player. So I'll go um, through these four and make some notes about them. The sign will here refer to the more general sense of a signifying entity, whether it's an alphanumeric text, imagery, or sound. The role of the sign therefore refers to the interpretable representational elements that players read in order to be able to interact with the game. In the case of computer games, the representational sign might be made of the same code that dictates the behavior of AI agents or the material density of a wooden fence. But for the sake of analysis, it makes sense to separate these two configurations of code since they perform very different functions in the game object and process. The specificity of the material instantiation of the game, that is, the medium, also needs to be taken into consideration. Even if the same game is being discussed, its incarnation on a PlayStation and a PC will influence the form and experience to varying degrees. For example, an RTS game um, on a play PlayStation, using a PlayStation controller, um, ha makes a very different experience than playing it on a PC. Um, generally more annoying. Different types of hardware also allow for different social contexts in which the games are played. This becomes even more marked when we consider the same ludomechanical structure of board games expressed in code. Although this aspect of the game may remain the same, that is, I am still playing Settlers of Catan with the exact same rules on a computer as I would on a table, the practice of playing the game as process is going to be different. So the lack of a tangible board laid out on a table, resource cards are done by players and so on, makes it for quite a different experience, right? Whether this can or should be called a different game altogether is less important than having an adequate analytical tool to account for the differences. On the players. We are here using the term player to refer to the human agent that engages with the system. Although we are using the term player, we are not here subscribing to a notion of play that prescribes a particular experiential disposition, such as playfulness. From the game as objective perspective, the player is conceived as an ideal or an implied player. When we turn to the game as process, we conceive of the player, corner of the pyramid, as the actual active player and the set of practices she deploys in engaging with the game world and game system. These practices are always considered in relation to the social and cultural context players find themselves in. 
In the enactment of the game as process, it is often the case that different players interacting with the same structure, science and medium, actually perceive a different game. I might be playing a conventional Call of Duty 4 online deathmatch game, trying to help my team score as many kills as possible, but avoiding giving kills to the enemy. But at the same time, there is some form of game playing quite a different game. Game of getting this clearly contradicting what I'm trying to do. Now here I am on team speak with my, my four buddies trying to outflank the other team, and there's this happy bunny jumping off this building and giving away um, you know, kills to the enemy. And clearly our two games are conflicting. And we can't say that the game doesn't support this. The achievement system is there, and it's something that all players pursue. But the goals there, so the ludic structure of the, of, of the, um, this other player. It's clearly different from mine, even though we're in the same environment. The pyramid diagram shows how even the same base trial of the sign, medium, and structure in the resulting game can be different depending on the dispositions of the players enacting it. And thus multiple versions of the game might be played simultaneously within the game space, as in the bunny example. And here are a couple of, so we're trying to use this 3D um, diagram to, to um, show these different um, takes, different ideas of, of perspectives on the game um, from different players. So here are two views on this game that are quite closely aligned, and two um, perspectives that are quite different. So the structure. Now the notion of a machinic structure underlying the sign is a crucial component of games. The structure operative in games can be divided into three broad categories, the social, the ludic, and environmental. Social structures are present whenever there is more than one player involved in the game process. We are here using the term social structure rather than social rules to specify a subset of social rules, as in general social rules, that are an intrinsic part of the game object and process. Some of these play a formative role in the negotiation of the ludic structures, while others are more strictly related to the communication during gameplay. In, um, using TeamSpeak or, or typing in a chat box. So a game of Counter-Strike Source would be quite different uh, if this communication layer is taken away. It would be different both in terms of the ability for players to collaborate during the course of the game, but also for the general sense of community facilitated by such structures of communication. Overlapping with the ludic structures, social structures also importantly influence the accepted conventions that make up the game. At times, this can create also David Myers has given an interesting account of a social experiment in City of Heroes, which highlights the consequences of adhering to the ludic structures while ignoring the social conventions by the game's inhabitants. So ludic structures are a common denominator in members of the game family, but these structures can vary greatly between games. In analog games, ludic structures are suggested by the game designers, but it is up to the players to uphold them, making them dependent on convention. This often creates situations where ludic structures are negotiated by players and altered to suit their whims. In such cases, ludic structures become informed by social structures and can be seen as a hybrid of the two. Refer we refer to these as con conventional ludic structures. Some computer games allow for a variation of the ludic ludomechanic structures by giving players the option to alter the parameters of the game. For example, in Call of Duty 4 again, we can decide whether the crosshairs are visible or not not in hardcore mode, um, the degree of damage weapons make compared to the health and so on. Other aspects of the ludomechanic structures are harder to modify. Players would need to amend the actual code of the game in order to change the rules. In multiplayer games, however, we often see a coexistence of conventional and machinic structures. A particular clan's Counter-Strike source server might use the standard ludomechanic structures written into the game, but verbally agree not to allow sniper rifles, the dreaded AWP. The player would still be able to purchase the banned rifle, but they usually would be kicked if they do so again after a warning from the server administrators. Environmental structures are found in both physical and virtual environments. In physical environments, natural laws may be implicitly considered when designed. For football, or basketball, and so on, even though no specific rule addresses it. And playing a game of football on the moon will make it quite a different game, if it's possible at all. 
in virtual environments, such environmental physics, are modeled into the game world. The virtual here refers not only to the computer generated, but to any constructed environment or world that has physical properties modeled into it. For example, the fact that the game system of a tabletop RPG indicates that a three meter fall uh, will yield three die six damage, gives the world an environment machinic structure that gives additional body or substance to the shared imagination, turning it into a simulated model. Computer generated environments have their physical properties hard coded into them. For example, bricks in Call of Duty 4 have a certain density which resists a 9mm pistol round um, but would be penetrated by a 556 round of an M4A1, for example. Similarly, the player avatars can run, walk, crawl and at different speeds, all of which influence the ludic structures of the game and are crucial in creating balanced and enjoyable experiences. But again, the difference between a computer generated environment and an analog one is that in the former, the environmental machine structures are upheld by the computer when the latter, they are maintained by the players in accordance with a prescribed and often modified system. So, the model outlined above can be used to describe various family resemblances, to use uh, Wittgenstein's term, of members in the game family. It accounts for the analog and computer-based games and is aimed to be used as a heuristic tool to analyze games and identify the important differences between different members of this complex extended family. The application of the model should make it clearer that having a conversation about an analytical or a theoretical topic that encom encompasses different members can often yield vague and possible contra contradicting conclusions. Mist has a great narrative, Tetris doesn't, and so on. You're familiar with that discussion. The complexity and resulting theoretical confusion brought about by the advent of co computer gaming is only growing. The most significant source of this complexity arises from the fact that a considerable proportion of what, what are called games nowadays are in fact virtual environments which contain a game or multiple games within them, or no games at all. If we had to apply the model to a game like Grand Theft Auto 4, for example, we would end up with a number of different game pyramids, these little things in there, um, embedded in the same environment, rather than one game pyramid that would equally adequately define them all. The material, medium, science, social, and environmental structures that form the virtual environment remain the same for all embedded games, but the ludic structures and player perspectives could change in each case. In Wittgenstein's terms, contemporary computer games like Grand Theft Auto 4, World of Warcraft, and even Half-Life 2 are members of at least two families that mingle resemblances. They contain both the features of virtual environments and of games, and form a group of members derived from both families. So the important thing to consider here is that the virtual environment supported uh, the virtual environment family is not equivalent to the game's family. They are, there are virtual environments which have no ludic qualities at all. They are still supported by computing hardware, have a sign layer, involve human agents, and contain social and environmental structures. But they contain no ludic structures. Now, virtual environments vary in the degree um, to which they simulate um, the world they aim to represent. They can vary from the minimal qualities of Pong, Zarina, to the sprawling landscapes of Middle Earth in Lord of the Rings Online. Certain combinations of structure, sign, and material medium are, de are designed to restrict the player activity, while other configurations are designed to generate varieties of player expression. There are virtual environments which align fully with the game that takes place within them, making it redundant to separate between the two. In Tetris, the affordances for player activity, for example, are limited to rotating the pieces, moving them left, right, down, and that's about it. The variety of activity that players can undertake is kind of limited. So in GTA 4, for example, um, players have a wider latitude of expression. So the flattened pyramid here reflects the restricted abilities of Tetris, with the higher one representing um, the very varied activity allowed by GTA 4. But one tendency in mainstream game titles is towards more complex extended game environments. And by extended, we are here referring to virtual game environments which are creating, which are catering to activities other than those afforded by the ludic structures. In these cases, players conceive of certain computer screen images as, repre as representing an extended virtual environment because they can engage meaningfully with the in entities that inhabit it, which can be human or AI controlled, and or the objects in the perceptual space delineated by the computer as they would in ordinary experience. They can run through the door in the west, wall, or, 
or run through the passage in the east. They can do a handbrake turn uh, to lose the car tailing them or speed ahead along the highway. The responsibility for action is placed on the player, but then the constraints laid, placed upon the game by the environment and the designers. Now, we're going to give two examples to, to show how this uh, model or our view of, of this idea of family resemblances um, can, can create confusion in, uh, in some issues that are being discussed in game studies. Um, one of them is the uh, immersion concept. Now, its formulation is, is um, safe to say, is rather vague and often contradictory. Uh, Salen and Zimmerman, for example, oppose the notion of immersion as a sense of being inside and surrounded by a virtual environment that is most popularized by Murray. They argue that such an experience is not really an important aspect of game engagement, referring to its erroneous focus on the sense of inhabiting the game environment as the immersive fallacy. And this is the idea that the pleasure of a media, media experience lies in its ability to essentially transport the participant into an illusory, simulated reality. According to the immersive fallacy, this reality is so complete that ideally the frame falls away so that the player truly believes that he or she is part of the imaginary world. So for Salem and Zimmerman, the drive towards what they call total immersion is not the most important aspect of game enjoyment and engagement. They support their argument by citing um, Gorfinkel's view on immersion. And she says that the confusion in this conversation has emerged because representation strategies are conflated with the effect of immersion. Immersion itself is not tied to replication of mimesis or reality. For example, one can get immersed in Tetris. Therefore, immersion into gameplay seems at least as important as immersion in a game's representation of space. An example of games in which immersion is not tied to a sensory replication of reality. They rightly highlight the problems associated with relating immersion to representation of mimesis and the importance of not basing design principles solely on a reproduction of more realistic representations in digital form. If designers remain caught up in a desire for the technology of the whole, that can say, as I say, the possibility for the maturity of the medium might be several, severely challenged. But this point is made at the cost of specificity of the meaning of immersion that was employed to signify within the intersection of virtual environment and game families. Now, these hybrids that we have called virtual game environments to try and uh, account for that center overlapping of these two families, thrive on giving the player a sense of habitation within their domains. Now, when Salem, Zimmerman, and Gorfinkel use Tetris as an example to invalidate the habitation sense of immersion, they are problematically applying a theoretical term developed for media objects at the intersection of extended virtual environments to an altogether different member of the game family, the single screen minimalist puzzle game that is Tetris. By swapping the virtual environment specific use of the concept of immersion with its more general sense of absorption and inactivity, Salem, Zimmerman, and Gorfinkel ignored the varying features of the members of the game family. The habitation or transportation sense of immersion is not invalidated by its application to a subset of the family. It was never intended to be applied to. On the contrary, it reminds us that the different features of members in the family require analysis based on their specific qualities, not those of their distant cousins. In this case, the central varying features are the spatial metaphor used in both and the way players navigate the relevant spaces. Immersion in the virtual environment habitation sense is directly related to the spatial affordances of the virtual environment, as Ryan has argued. So, as Ryan says, for a text to be immersive, then it must create a space to which the reader, spectator, or player can relate. And it must, be po must populate the space with individuated objects. For immersion to take place, the text must offer an expanse to be immersed within. And this expanse, in a blatantly mixed metaphor, is not a notion but a textual world. But the confusion of the concept and the arguments leveled against it are therefore not related to the experience itself, but to a lack of consideration for the different features of the members that make up the families of games and virtual environments. If we analyze, for example, GTA 4, again, and Tetris using the model represented here, it becomes clear that the virtual environment plotted by the former contains multiple games within it, as I said earlier visually expressed as a pyramid representing the virtual environment of Liberty City, with a number of small pyramids representing embedded subgames, the darts, bowling, and so on. Tetris, on the other hand, is represented by one pyramid since its virtual environment is aligned perfectly with the game that it supports. Okay, let's just the same briefly, that's our 
We don't have time. The, uh, so there's this confusion of whether games are natural or not. And as I said, this can be solved simply by acknowledging that we are using the word game in different ways. And uh, Because computer games are certainly not uh, only games, they're also something quite different. And they can contain anything. Any, I mean, a computer game, as we call them, are basically a piece of software that can simulate or emulate any other medium uh, quite Music, text, still image, video, anything that you can think of. Uh, not only what uh, would be reasonably called a game. Uh, and so this metonymical problem uh, that the, the, the word game can point to uh, the whole package of a, of a software, uh, a piece of software, or just the game structure within it, uh, becomes problematic uh, when we see this debate uh, between people who look at games as some sort of stories and people who say that stories are, are simply, or, or that the computer games are simply not uh, narrative. So this is a merely verbal disagreement, as Arne Nes would have said. Uh, the narrativists use games metonymically to refer to everything, uh, and the methodologists are referring only to the ludic structure <coughs> within the software package. Uh, anyway, to conclude, I think we've more or less reached our end. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think, or we don't think, uh, that uh, one definition to rule them all uh, is either needed nor necessary, or even uh, uh, possible. Uh, it could only lead to, or, or be a barrier of, of uh, productive interdisciplinary discussion, because uh, every uh, uh, sub-discipline within game studies would probably need their own definition. Uh, and uh, we think that if we don't have such an exclusionary definition, we're probably much more likely to have a lively and evolving field. So, uh, and as I said, computer games, what we call computer games, are basically uh, complex software packages, and they can contain a number of things beside games. Uh, virtual worlds are not the same as games, that mistake has often been made. Uh, and just because a computer game can contain a story, that doesn't mean that games are stories. So our model, the player, is, even if it's overproductive, it certainly also can be used on things that are not games. It still describes games uh, to a much more nuanced and adequate uh, level than, than we've seen previously. Uh, not least because it includes both the object perspective and the process perspective, and both of these are needed if uh, we are going to be talking to each other Thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to questions.
here example, we if we use if, if we analyze this trip through these words a sign, a medium, a semiotic analysis of the IKEA trip, would that be more strange and unorthodox than doing the same with a, a virtual world type computer game? Are there any significant differences between those two experiences that would validate using sign and language and medium and semiotic analysis about one of them, about the game experience, but not about, uh, not applied to IKEA, the, the, my tour through IKEA? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, clearly IKEA is a structured uh, uh, system that is uh, intended to do certain experiences, uh, just like this uh, situation here, for instance, or this building. So, it, so it, the semiotic approach is not inherently more valuable or valid applied to a virtual world computer game than it would be applied to a trip to IKEA. Probably not. Okay. I mean, why, yeah. why wouldn't you, uh, if you want to, analyze IKEA with yeah, semiotics? Yeah, people, people do that. Yes. Yeah. So what's... Yeah. No, I, I was just... No. That's very clear. Sorry? I think, yeah, thanks. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's the fact that we're right. saying that it's, it's ultimately a player's perspective that um, makes a game a game. I mean, if we went to IKEA and we um, were going to play a collect the you know, little red tables, decide to play the little red tables game, IKEA provides the structure, sign, and, and the material medium for that um, gameless process to, to take place, right? And ultimately, it's our perspective on it, our agreement. And that's why in structure we have this, this conventional social structure that, that accounts for that. So, what, what have we agreed upon to be the game? Um, so the, the structure is not merely, remember, there's three parts to it, right? That, um, that accounts for it. So, so IKEA would merely be the, more or less the equivalent of uh, a virtual world, except that it's not virtual. It's confined, but it's physical. And of course, the... It's and no ludic structure. It's not a ma matter only of having signs, of having material medium and so on, but the kinds of signs, and models meant to sort of, those are placeholders for the kinds of signs um, and so on that, that, that get there. I'll just bring it up. And now, Heidi, hi. Yes, um, two questions, actually. Uh, first, why do you call your model descriptive? I mean, what's the force of calling it a descriptive model? Uh, as opposed to, yes. Well, as opposed to normal, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the first question. Um, secondly, um, couldn't your descriptive model be expressed uh, in terms of a, of a very long disjunctive definition along the lines of, of the grant? Yes, thank you. Uh, the disjunctive de definition lists a number of qualities. What we are trying to account for, I mean, I think that they overlap, but what we are trying to account for is a more of a matrix structure where each of the points is influencing the others, right? So it's a matter of a different way of putting it, I guess. But it's a matrix structure versus a list. Sorry, okay. Matrix structure versus a list. Uh, we don't actually have any sort of uh, X, uh, uh, four states to assume that, do we? I mean, these are the things that we see making up the elements uh, that make up games. They also happen to make up other phenomena that are not necessarily called games. And now Lee, and then we have time for no more questions. <laughs> Saying it's the other way around? Uh, if anything, if, if you, mean like, like, like you should say that one thing was the other, I'd say the other way around. But, but what so, do you mean? So you would say that na uh, narratologists are actually ludologists? Well, that, you could that would be more right like for me. Well, yeah. they're both but right, because they're both I, making I a. Say are, uh, well, I would say they're both, I mean, yes, the, in fact, you, you could say that, and you wouldn't be wrong. Uh, there are about five uh, ludologists in the world. I personally am one of them. Uh, and I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm a narratologist by training. And so are the other four. So everybody who's been pointed to, uh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just leaving on a jet plane. I'm just taking off. Yeah. I got a test to play. Uh, so every, 
You don't want to open it, do you? A can of worms, we shouldn't you? No, this is, this is your fault. <laughs> Opening that can of worms. Uh, so, the, every, every ludologist uh, uh, that is being pointed at, framed as a ludologist, is actually a narratologist by training. They are using narrative theory uh, to discuss games. I've done that, Escalade has done that, uh, Yes, you did that, Gonzalo uh, Frosca did that. Then you see that every six textual, um, or every, um, like when you write something, you become an attorney. No, 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 no. But uh, I'm just saying that this is this is crazy notion uh, made by some not so smart people. Uh, I'm not going to use the word stupid since Obama fairly shouldn't have done that either. Uh, not so smart people uh, uh, have made a strange, a false dichotomy between narratologists, people who, who study uh, story structure, uh, and ludologists, people who are interested in, in looking specifically at games. Uh, but the funny thing is those people who started saying we should look specifically at games, they were actually using narratological tools to do that. So there is no, there's, there's a false, uh, 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 falsely constructed conflict there. Well, in, in, instead, what you have is, is a conflict between the normative and the, and the uh, descriptive. So some people say uh, you shouldn't combine games and stories because that makes a really bad product. Uh, other people are saying you shouldn't uh, uh, you shouldn't look at games as uh, just games as stories because that's a that's a flawed perspective. And those are two different positions that are conflated by people who don't understand what narratology means. It used to mean people who are uh, studying stories, uh, and now it seems to mean somebody who says that uh, games are stories. That's a non yeah. So I hope that you clarify something. Okay. So I guess that's uh, the end of the... As you can hear, the auditorium itself tells us to leave it. <laughs> it's lunchtime, and unfortunately we only have less than 50 minutes for lunch. And we will start at 12.30 exactly.